officers that we did not have before. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right. Thank you to this group. We'll call up the next panel. Uh, Bernadette Segura, Alberto Mesca, Jr., Kenneth uh, Kreniger. Approval with a K like Craig. That one. And uh, Jody Casey. That's Bernadette Segura, Alberto Mesca, what you said, Kenneth, and Jody Casey. All right, who is Bernadette? Hi. You can go first, Bernadette. Okay. Can you, is that okay? Yeah. You okay. Uh, my name is Bernadette Segura. I'm the health law team manager at Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid. I'm an attorney there. I'm here to discuss the public health crisis currently facing low and middle income Texans that is, the, um, that is affecting um, low and middle income Texans uh, because of this violence and mass shootings. A mass shooting event does not affect only individuals who are individually wealthy or those who have health insurance. There are currently over 5 million Texans who are uninsured. One recent estimate indicates that close to 20% of El Paso County's adult population is currently uninsured. These are Texans, these are Americans, and our neighbors. When my organization was invited to participate in the task force created to develop the protocols for the foundation funds, I was asked to be a part of, if, of it as my specialization at legal aid focused primarily on state and federal benefits, patient side health law, and low income patient Medicaid advocacy. As the community and the world generously stepped up and donated to GoFundMe accounts, passed the hat at soccer games, and donated to the funds set up by our local community foundations, my thoughts immediately turned to the short and long-term impact on eligibility for state and federal benefits. In most cases, the survivors were not receiving public benefits before they were victims of this shooting. The vast majority of them were working class El Pasoans and what instance they were out shopping for groceries or taking advantage of back to school sales. As they became victims or survivors of violent crime, community law enforcement and agencies assisted with applications for the crime victims' compensation benefits, and some hospitals began their usual practice of assisting with applications for emergency Medicaid, presumptive Medicaid, and disability benefits for those who applied. Families at discharge were then faced with billing and collection practices that ranged from very kind to robotic to aggressive and offensive. The fact of the matter is that in this country, medicine is money. Necessary and life-saving treatment must be paid for. Crime victims' compensation is a payer of last resort. Needs-based benefits such as Medicaid have strict income and resource limits. Just to give you a real-world example of a client that we have, with a two-parent household, both of them were working at the time of the shooting. Both of them were victims of the shooting. Neither parent had health insurance, but their children were insured. Both parents were shot and had to go to the emergency room. One parent was hospitalized for three days. The other is still hospitalized. An emergency room visit plus three days in the hospital for a gunshot wound would likely result in medical bills already over the aggregate cap for CVC that is currently set at $50,000. An emergency room visit plus two months in the intensive care unit at a hospital plus the numerous surgeries would result in medical bills millions of dollars over the CVC caps. And that includes the aggregate that you can add to for catastrophic injuries, which is an additional 75 if the individual is able to prove up that they have that catastrophic um, injuries or circumstance. These caps are totally expended even before we consider the costs of inpatient skilled nursing, which Pastor Grady mentioned to you earlier, physical therapy, home health care, child care, lost wages, and psychological treatment. The caps of the CBC statute do not currently reflect the reality of the damage caused by injuries sustained from these types of gunshot wounds. Relying on the kindness of strangers donating to GoFundMes or foundations is not a real world solution to the income and asset tests, to the limits of the CVC program, and the lack of affordable insurance in Texas.
Thank you very much. And you may have noticed I'm letting the ones, because you're speaking for victims, so I tend to let the victims go on a little past your limit. So for later, when I strip with other people on two minutes, the reason is because I understand you are representing a victim's voice here. And we yes, appreciate thank you. That. So we want to make sure we understand the issues that they are confronting. Thank you so much. Um, and Mr. Messner? Yes. Go ahead. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Alberto Mesto Jr. I'm the managing attorney for Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid Cell Paso Office, and I was joined today with my colleagues who we already spoke, Bernadette Segura and Veronica Carvajal. TRLA provides free legal services to residents in 68 Southwest Texas counties. A major part of our funding is provided by the Texas Supreme Court through the Texas Access to Justice Foundation. And our office has attorneys that practice in a wide variety of legal areas, meaning that the private bar does not have expertise such as Bernadette in public benefits and landlord tenant. When the August 3rd terrorist attack occurred, we immediately started working on the response to the legal issues that will most likely appear. Our program has a natural disaster team that works on the aftermath of hurricane and flooding, and we adopted that model to this incident. Immediately after the shooting, we interviewed clients, victims at the El Paso Resiliency Center at the Convention Center. We collaborated with the El Paso Bar Association to host a presentation on how to respond to community disasters where five TRLA attorneys presented on different legal needs the victims will need and how to get the private bar involved and invested in helping the victims long term. More than 75 attorneys and judges attended. Moreover, I'm a member of the One Fund El Paso Task Force, which is a task force established by the two foundations that received the $6 million plus in donations and are in the process of distributing it out to the, to the victims. And as part of the task force, I provided our office its expertise was tremendous help by Veronica Carvajal and de Segura on establishing the best practices and helping the legal needs of the victims through the donation of this money. We have been consistently involved in outreach, receiving referrals from one fund and community partners, handling cases ourselves and trying to place cases with a private bar. As of today's date, we have 31 cases involving the shooting victims with 24 individuals. We have helped victims with CVC applications, applications for public benefits, research regarding the impact of gifts on public benefits, advocacy regarding the rights to emergency Medicaid at the hospitals, especially the private hospitals, advice on family and probate issues. Many of the victims died without wills. And basic landlord-tenant issues about uh, an advisory regarding reverse mortgages and traditional mortgage and referrals. Because now with the, the mass shooting, the legal issues have started and they haven't stopped. And we created a sh series of short videos on these topics as well, which we posted on our website. And we made referrals to the private bar in order to you know, at least alleviate some of the, 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 the demand we've had for legal services. But sometimes that's problematic because the private bar many times wants uncontested easy cases and they don't want to get into the complicated cases where people are fighting about the probate. However, our involvement has come with a cost. Our staff, and probably like many other service agencies, has suffered secondary trauma from hearing graphic details of the mass shooting while conduct conducting intakes with the victims. We cry with the victims when they recount the details of a death of a loved one. We take on their anxiety and stress thinking about how to pay six or seven figure medical bills and we share their frustration when we try to place cases with a private bar and they don't take them, or that CBC's monies are taking a long time to get there, and we have to ask the foundation to at least offset some of the costs. TRLA has been here to advocate for the victims and, and trying to ensure that their grief is now compounded by the many legal issues that they confront. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Kenneth? Hello, my name is Kenneth Kruger. I am a U.S. Army veteran, having spent 20-plus years in the Army, retiring in June of 1994. At first, I was taught how to defend our country, and that included killing people using the weapons of war. When I became a sergeant, I taught younger soldiers these weapons of war. Not one time since June the 30th of 1994 did the thought enter my mind of slinging a bandolier of M1 clips over one shoulder and my M1 Garand over the other shoulder and going downtown to the mall or the uh, uh, concert to commit mass murder. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not once in 25 years. 
There are thousands of military retirees in El Paso and Doniana counties who I believe have never had that thought either. I'm not going to sit here and tell you sob stories about those sick fools who commit criminal acts which result in innocent deaths. But I can tell you that if I had been at that Walmart, armed or not, I would have charged that individual even if it resulted in my own death. You see, I was taught to defend innocent life. I was taught to that my fellow man's life is worth protecting. I was also taught that freedom is worth protecting. I stood ready to put my life on the line to protect our precious freedoms for over two decades. I signed a blank check to my country because I believe in our form of government that gives power to the people, protects our rights, and ensures that we are considered innocent until proven guilty. I am appalled and disgusted that those freedoms are under attack today from our own legislators. I have I heard ideas from this committee for gun restrictions, red frag laws, increased background checks, and more. I oppose these ideas because I believe they threaten our security. They certainly don't stop mass violence and they actually destroy community safety. The government has no right to tell me how many bullets I can have. The government has no right to come into my house to take my weapons away from me based on remarks from an unknown accuser without due process. As a postscript, I will ask uh, this gentleman next to me at bond, they said that the uh, Mexican nationals would receive funds from that one fund. Now I heard a gentleman's uh, uh, Jaime Esparza say they wouldn't. And okay. two, and when, just you, go wrap your thoughts up, sir, when you go back to Austin, thank you. tell the governor to hang that SOB in San Jacinto Plaza here in El Paso. Okay, Ma thank you. Madam, Madam, uh, Madam Chair. Well, just, just a minute, because I want to admonish the audience. I understand everybody has feelings on this issue, some on this side, some in the middle, all over the place. But we're not going to have applause or outburst or anything. You just everyone's going to listen courteously, and we'll leave it at that. Yes, you have a question. I have a question. Go ahead, Senator uh, Mr. Kruger, I assume you will defend my right to disagree with you. Yes, sir. Okay, that's good. I mean, that's, you come from right where I come from. I grew up in the Heights. How you know where I'm from? The Heights. Yes, sir. In Houston. Oh, yes, Actually, I was born and raised in Hill County, north of Waco. Oh, okay. Moved to the Heights in the ninth grade. So a lot of my values are country values mm -hmm. with big city opportunities. But uh, you're obviously very passionate, and I respect your opinion. But I hope a couple of your comments kind of attack the legislature for kind of disagreeing with you maybe in previous hearings and maybe even something I said today. But uh, I hope you understand we're all in this together. There's no visiting team. We're all the home team. So I just wanted to tell you thanks for being here. But, you know, a lot of your comments I disagree with, and that's the process that we work under. So you're telling me you support constitutional carry? We're not going to get to That's that. not before us. And, and I to will answer say your question, no. But I, I definitely, as I asked the good doctor, am, I'm desperate to try to find some measures, reasonable measures, to be proactive in early intervention, certainly as it comes to psychological uh, treatment and recognition, and just try to make this a safer community because we've got some really bad tragedies that no one measure would have probably prevented. But I think if we can have an open discussion, maybe we can build maybe a consensus around something. Would you sponsor a bill that will allow retired law enforcement and retired uh, military to carry armed in our high schools? I've I actually, I believe, I, carry, I, believe I, I carried one to allow retired law enforcement certified peace officers carry a weapon. I'm trained. <laughs> so uh, I think what we ought to entertain your suggestion, but I hope you would be open about mine on a red flag when we see a really, really disturbed person that some early intervention to say, maybe until you get some help, you shouldn't have your firearm. How much would it cost to get the firearm back? I'm sorry, what? How much would it cost to get the firearm back? But that, that's immaterial. I, I understand. No, we'll I work believe out the details. That. We'll work out the details. But I just think, you know, this is the purpose in this hearing, to hear from you and the other witnesses and, and think that no one of us has got all the ideas, but collectively we're smarter than we are individually. If you uh, feel that they shouldn't have the firearm, why don't you easily just send them to prison and uh, fill them up with those mind-altering drugs so that they uh, – out there in La La Land, and, and that might be in, uh, inclusive of the ones that are hearing voices. 
not the ones that don't know if they're a man or a woman. Okay. All right. We're, we're going to move on if it's sooner with Myra. Yeah, I'm uh, ready to move on. Oh, I thought you would be. So, uh, Thank Ms. you. Ms. Casey. You're Hi. Hi. Thank you all for being here in our community. We really appreciate you coming and listening to everyone here, so thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jody Casey. I am the co-chapter leader for the Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America chapter here in El Paso. We were started long before um, the mass shooting on August 3rd. I am also a working mom. I'm an executive with a company out of Austin, and I have two boys who are seven and nine. And um, common sense gun safety is really important to me because I have um, uh, a history of something in my family where my younger brother was at a friend's house and was almost shot through the head. The bullet missed him when he was nine years old by an inch because the weapon was not safely stored. So I'm a big advocate for safe storage as well as is Moms Demand Action, and that's my history. So I am here today to first ground us on why we're all sitting in this room. We're sitting in this room because a hate crime was committed. So I've heard a lot of talk today about mental illness. Hate and discrimination are learned behaviors, and we do a huge disservice to all of those who need help with mental illness when we blame mass shootings on the mentally ill, and that's the only thing that we say about mass shootings. Hate and discrimination are learned behaviors. Just grounding us on why you're sitting in El Paso today. The second thing that I want to say is I just believe in common sense gun laws. I believe in the Second Amendment. And when I mean gun, common sense gun laws, I'm asking this committee to think about really strong red flag laws and background checks on all gun sales, which 95% of all Americans support. That is all we are asking today, and I'm representing all the mothers out there who are concerned for their children's safety, but we have data and facts to support why I'm sitting here talking to you. Children and adolescents, the second leading cause of death for children and adolescents in this country is gun, gun violence. And if you are a child of color, it's the first leading cause of death. And so as an executive, and a mom, I like to stick to the data and the facts. And I'm asking this Senate committee to be sensible and just think about what would work. We're talking about a shooter who was hateful and discriminatory and whose mother called the police about the fact that he had an AR-15. Had we had a channel for that red flag law, this would not have happened. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Casey. Any questions? Thank you very much to this panel for participating. All are excused. Thank you. We'll call it the next panel. Persis Bieben, Michael Gutierrez, Daniel Tires, Tires, maybe, and Norma Apagaca. Mr. Rodriguez, you represent everybody here. Because there's a place on here where they put who their state senator is. And usually at these hearings, we have, they represent all kind of different senators. So you're unique because everyone is right here. It's, we have a lovely group of constituents. All right. Persis, you're first. Hello. My name is Persis Bevan. I'm a volunteer with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. But here, today, I'm here to talk about my, how gun violence has touched my own life. My friend and I, like many members of our binational community, were born in El Paso, Texas, but grew up in attended schools in Juarez. We met in our freshman year of high school and remained close friends until I joined the Army and was stationed in South Korea. During my hardest times in basic training, when I wanted to go AWOL or thought that I could never accomplish a 15K road march or a 10-mile run, through phone calls and letters, he remained my biggest supporter and cheerleader. I owe part of my success and accomplishments to him. After I exited the military, we continued our friendship, but time and his lack of social media drew distance between us. This year, he called me in the middle of March, asking me for help with his marriage. Although I was leaving my house, I could feel a cry for help in his voice and I stayed with him on the phone for two hours. I invited him to come to my house to sort things out and to create a plan to save his marriage. He was desperate because his wife didn't want to try anything and refused to attend marriage counseling. 
I asked him to come over and vent with my husband and I. He had already moved out of his family home into an apartment without a washer and dryer. So he brought his dirty laundry and asked if he could do a load at my house. I obviously helped him and added fabric softener before the rinsing cycle as I told him the smell would make him happier. I can still see his smile when we pull his laundry out of the dryer and, and him saying, you were right, I can't stop smelling the downy. We talked for hours and brainstorm ideas to convince his wife to give their marriage another chance. I knew he was not being himself as he had always been positive in the past, so I asked if he had a gun. He informed me that his gun was in a safe at home he used to share with his wife. At this time, I was learning about Moms Demand Action Online and about red flag laws passed in states like Connecticut, Indiana, California, Washington, Oregon, Colorado, Nevada, and Hawaii. Sadly, I knew that Texas didn't have a way to ask for help from police and the court to remove his gun. After my friend left my house, I was not at ease, but we texted the next day. Then I didn't check on him like I should have had. A week later, he had been a victim of death by suicide. He shot himself twice in his apartment. I know that he didn't want to leave his son without a father and that things could have changed and he could have gotten through his despair. I'm not sure how he got a hold of his gun and I wish he had just left it in the safe. I wish others around him were more vigilant and kept him from accessing the gun. I wish I could have helped him more and checked on him. My friend and his wife struggled for years to have a child and after eight years of marriage and many treatments, they welcomed a baby boy. That baby boy is two years old now and would never get to see how amazing and caring his dad was. I know people who want to end their life are less likely to act upon it if a gun is not around, but he was so des depressed that he relied on the weapon that was accessible to him. Access to a gun increases the risk of death by suicide by three times. Men represent 86% of firearm suicide victims. There's no coincidence. Men do not seek mental health counseling. Our culture encourages men to remain strong and to not ask for help. I believe my friend wanted most of all to stay alive and be a father, but the fact that he had a gun and no one was able to remove it from him added him to the 60 people who died by firearm suicide each day. My friend's son will never get to play with his father and will live wondering why his daddy is not around. Please help us help the ones who need support by removing their guns when they are going through a hardship before it is too late. Red flag laws save lives, and I wish I could have helped raise that flag for him. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Gutierrez. Hello, my name is Michael Gutierrez. I'm currently a freshman attending the University of Texas at El Paso. Three years ago, during my senior year of high school, I personally witnessed the effects of gun violence. A fellow classmate of mine named, named by Dave, who was named David Joseph was shot and murdered by a police officer. I heard a lot today of the senators saying that this does not define Texas. This absolutely defines Texas. Four mass shootings, 65 dead, three years, and we're still living in a state of fear. We're living in an age where we cannot feel safe to leave our lives, to live our daily lives. I witnessed the events of August 3rd, 2019, wondering who would commit such an atrocity to the community that is so loving, like El Paso. When the reports of the manifesto began trickling in, it became so clear this was an act of domestic terrorism. He traveled to El Paso to murder people of Latinx heritage. He stated, in, and he stated specifically, however, when our leaders were failed to call the act domestic terrorism, I became utterly disappointed. It is our leader's duty to hold accountability to the actions of a white supremacist. Accusing young people in social media is not the problem. It is a president exhibiting hateful rhetoric who we should be holding accountable. Today, I call those in leadership to action. We, the silent majority of young people, are waiting, and we are, wait and we are watching. We are frustrated, we are tired, and we have had enough. Every day when I leave my house, I leave with a copy of the Constitution because I believe in it. And when I open my Constitution, the first thing I see is a statement by John Marshall, a Constitution intended to endure the, for the ages to come and consequently to be adapted to those various crises of human affairs. This Constitution is made to be changed. We are made to adapt because us as humans evolve. And I've had enough. The NRA is not our Constitution. We the people are. 
So I urge you to stop this madness. And I urge you to save lives because this is in your hands. You are the legislator. You represent us. So enough is enough. And I don't let the suggestions fall on deaf ears. The suggestions made today, please hear them out because these are very good suggestions. And we need to change this because this is not only going to affect the lives of the young people going to this university, but who will attend this university one day. And I urge you to please find action with what's going on because enough is enough. Mr. Titus. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Distinguished members of this committee. My name is Daniel Tires, and I'm a leader of the El Paso Border Interfaith Organization, of EPISO. EPISO is the El Paso Interreligious Sponsoring Organization. It's a local nonprofit partisan community, and we work at the grassroots level to improve the lives of the people in our community. When we first heard when I first got word of the shooting on August the 3rd, I was called by our leader, Adri Garcia, to join her at the reunification center at MacArthur Middle School. I went there, and for the first time, I saw people in our community suffering, people not knowing about their loved ones, people not aware where their mother their sister, their brother, their cousins were. And I felt the fear, the loneliness, the confusion in that room. We quickly organized and said, what do the rest of us have to fear? We got together with our sponsoring organizations and institutions and had listening sessions. We listened to the people, just like you're doing right now. You're listening to us. We listened to the people in our communities, and they told us they had a palpable fear. They couldn't or they wouldn't go out to shop like they normally do. They were fearful of sending their kids to their schools. They were fearful of leaving their homes because of the mass shooting. So I tell you, not only did we have those listening sessions at our member institutions, we also approached the mental health, emergence, emergence health network that gave us instructions on how to recognize people that were suffering the traumas that they went through. Extremely helpful. We not only did that, but we also listened to FBI instructions on active shooter response. That's what we need in our community, to listen to the people that are suffering and respond to their needs. I urge you to listen and read Bishop Seitz's letter to the local people in El Paso. He talks about white supremacy. He talks about racism. He talks about healing. Please, let that be part of your reading when you go back to Austin. I also we're out of time, sir, so you need to wrap up your last thought. Yes. I gave you a little time. In response to Senator Whitmer, Whitmire's level, what can we do? I ask you, go back to Austin, go back to our governor and say, we need mental health education to recognize the people that are on the verge of not belonging to our community, that feels so alone and so left out. We need those resources. We secondly ask you to- Sir, can you, the, okay. the lady, maybe she can finish your thoughts. Sure. I know she's your same organization, so we'll try to be- Good afternoon. Ms. Apodaca, so why don't you finish? Okay, kind of um, thank different. you for allowing us to speak and thank you for being here. I think everybody's captured what I'm feeling, what everybody's feeling, hurt, anger, um, confusion. But most of all, what I hear from my community and in my church uh, when we have listening sessions is that we're, we are still suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Some of it's secondary. We have vets in the community who are crying, who, says, who tell us they've killed people in war but because they had to. But now to know that children were killed, mothers and fathers were killed, that's different. People are bringing back pain. And some of the, these members are from Juarez who now live here. 
who were victims of drug wars. And once they heard that this was happening, they started crying in our little circle saying that that pain came back. So if you're a soldier, if you were hurt in some violent trauma, this incident hurt you to the core. In listening to the, all the interviews uh, by the news to our fellow El Pasoans, the one that hurt me the most is when some teenagers were interviewed. These young girls, very eloquent, were asked, what do you think of all this? And it hurt me to the core. They said, we can't believe that this man drove hundreds of miles to El Paso to kill me, to kill us for the color of our skin. My skin protects me. I'm a Mexican-American, but my sisters, my uncles, my father were all dark skin, and they were discriminated. But fortunately, nothing happened to them, but they're carrying that pain now. Now they have to look behind their sh shoulders at the store everywhere. People already know their exit plans. They look for the police. But we really need mental health right now. We need to... Uh, go into churches, into schools. I know schools are doing a great job because we've talked to them. We need these uh, mental health coordinators. We need to be um, supplied to help our fellow members in our churches and schools and our city. Thank you. Thank you all very much for the input you've given us today. Thank you. All right, we'll call up the next panel. Adriana Garcia, Chris Yost, or Yost, Patrick Hernandez Sigaduista and Michael Abud, Abud, maybe. Okay. Adriana Garcia? Yes. You can get started, Ms. Garcia. Thank you. I'm uh, uh, the organizer for a piece of border interfaith. Two of my leaders just spoke. Uh, on August 3rd, I was on my way to Walmart. I was literally two minutes away before the shooting happened. I live three blocks from there, and you can just feel the eerie, um, my skin just, um, when, I, when I saw vehicle after vehicle, emergency vehicle passing me while I was uh, driving on my way there. Uh, our organization, like you heard, uh, jumped into action. We put a forum together with some of our representatives, city, county, and state, federal, officials to come together and agree on a three-part strategy. Our first strategy, our first part was listening sessions. You heard a little bit about that. We go into our churches, into our community at the grassroots level and hold these, these uh, listening sessions. People need time to be heard. We meant, uh, they mentioned it, mental health. People are grieving and people need to be heard. And these are a perfect example of how people can start, begin the process. Our second part of our strategy was the mental health part, and we have trainings for our leaders. Uh, we're working with the Catholic Diocese and Catholic Counseling Services to provide those services at the local level. A lot of people are afraid to come out to organizations or mental health agencies, and so we need to bring that service to them in their comfort zone where they're not able to, to come out of. And lastly, we have a strategy that we'd like to put forth or put on you. We want um, you to ask Governor Abbott to call a special session to allocate the resources for mental health and safety that can intervene at the local level so families and generations affected by this shooting won't carry this trauma and pass it on to our children and grandchildren. And secondly, do not sweep this under the rug. This hearing should not be in vain. If this does not happen today, we will be moving backwards. Um, we agree with the, the HB, HR 1112 and HR 8 to enhance background checks. Also, HR 1186 to res restrict high capacity magazines and HR 1236 to pass, pass federal red flag laws to prevent those deemed at risk to themselves and others to move forward. They've already passed at the House. We need them to move forward. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Garcia. Uh, Chris Yost. Good afternoon and welcome to El Paso. Good afternoon and welcome to El Paso. My name is Chris Yost. I'm a U.S. Army Infantry Combat Veteran who served tours in Iraq and now a disabled veteran. I also served in federal law enforcement with Immigration and Customs Enforcement under the Department of Homeland Security. I am also an NRA certified firearms instructor. 
My father was a 35-year veteran of the Philadelphia Housing Authority Police, and I have numerous family members who have also served in those fields. I have carried firearms in defense of this nation, granted freedom from tyranny and oppression in other countries, protected our nation and law enforcement, and I teach proper firearm safety, storage, cleaning, and use of firearms to those who refuse to be victims. Red flag laws violate our first, second, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh amendments. Red flag also violates our due process as an extreme risk protection order or ERPO is not legally obtained warrant, which falls in line with the fourth amendment. And any execution of the ERPO is a violation of our civil rights and therefore would be an act of aggression by the government. The same type of government oppression our founding fathers put forth the second amendment for. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, okay. Uh, you see, if you restrict the rights of the responsible legal gun owner, all you do is empower the criminal. Just look at places like Illinois and California, two of the strictest gun control laws on record, yet highest, have the highest numbers of gun violence crimes in this nation. Through my employment with ICE, I would have firsthand knowledge of the ex and experience with U.S. government funded and supported gun violence under the failed Obama administration gun control conspiracy known as Operation Fast and the Furious. Under Fast and the Furious, over 200 innocent people were murdered, including U.S. Border Patrol agent Brian Terry and ICE Special Agent Jaime Zapata, where guns that were knowingly and willingly allowed to be purchased by a straw buyers by the U.S. Department of Justice were allowed to be sold in the hopes of catching cartel members. However, this failed attempt backfired, and the Obama administration tried to sweep this under the rug. So you can see that government intervention with gun control is a failed flaw. It is an attempt on limiting those responsible and empowering the criminal. All right. Thank you, sir. May I ask a question? Of course. Go yes. Uh, I, I know that I'm not going to change your mind. You and I are on, on different uh, views with, regard, with regard to red flag laws. You heard earlier that I filed uh, one of those bills. In fact, I filed it in three separate sessions. But, but I want to make sure that when we talk about these issues, if we're going to try to reach any kind of consensus, is that we talk about the facts and the information that, that is out there available to us. This is a very emotional issue, and we all have our own emotions about it, as we've been hearing. But when you say that red flag laws are unconstitutional, um, the fact is that Courts that have looked at red flag laws have found the laws constitutional. Uh, the most recent one was, you recall, the, sh Parkland, uh, the shooting in Parkland, Florida, and the students over there went over to the legislature that was in its waning days, and they passed a red flag law. That, that law was challenged in court. The courts held it to be constitutional. So let's try to lay out the information that's out there for us and not do it on the basis of just how we feel. We ought to be working together based on what is doable and what works and what doesn't work. So that's, that's what I wanted to, to ask of you, to, to make statements that red flag laws are unconstitutional is simply not the case. Can I respond to that, Senator? Sure. Uh, under the unconstitutional side of it, uh, working in law enforcement, you need a warrant and probable cause. Hearsay is not inadmissible in court. A red flag law is simply the pretenses that a, a crime or violence may be committed, not the actual factual base a crime has committed. That's violating your Fourth Amendment. Well, uh, you, you can put all kinds of uh, interpretations on it. And as I said, I don't really want to argue with you. Uh, I'm just pointing out simply that the courts that have looked at these statutes have found them to be constitutional. I, I'm not aware of a single court that has looked at a red flag law that has said that it's unconstitutional. That, that's the point I wanted to make. But if you do look at the structure of our Constitution and the verbiage directly there, the Fourth Amendment is being violated because it's, there is no warrant, and ERPO is not a warrant. That is the protection of Fourth Amendment, the Fourth Amendment's protection from warrantless searches and seizures. 
by specifically targeting me because I'm a gun owner and someone may think that I'm a violent person, you're now violating my right, my protections by sending the police to my home to illegally enter my property, illegally seize my property under no crime being committed. That is the issue and that is sadly gonna cause more violence down the road because people have the right to self-defense. And when the police or any other law enforcement entity yeah. illegally enter your home, they are committing a, a crime and you have the legal justification to defend mm -hmm. yourself, property, and your family. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, I would just add to this discussion that we, we're here to talk about these issues, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, there's some states that have red flag laws, but Texas is perfectly free to craft a law with all the due process protections warrants written into them and so forth. So I think we should all just stand back and listen to all sides because there is no law before us that we are looking at at this time, okay? We're listening to ideas. Yeah, I understand. And, and a, a law can be written with every due process protection, including a warrant, warrant signed by a judge. And maybe some states have that. I'm, I don't know. I, okay, and who Thank is you, next? We have... You, sir, you want to introduce yourself. Yeah. My name is Patrick Hernandez Cigarista. I'm also a United States Army combat veteran. And uh, before I read this here, I didn't submit anything to you all, but I would like to share, uh, you know, how the situation impacted me. And uh, I don't know what the woman's name who was sitting up here previously, but it did cut deep. So uh, my family and I were on our way to uh, Disneyland uh, when the shooting occurred. And um, you know, by the time I saw everything on the news and realized the gravity of what happened, I went to uh, a local parish right down the street from Disney to pray for our community and also asked the parish priest to pray for us. And so uh, when I approached uh, the priest, I began to ask him, could you please pray? And before I can get all the words out, I just started bawling. So here I am, 6'1", 250, probably cried twice in the last 15 years and uh, I just wanted to, everyone to know that you know how I felt uh, I do feel you know the humanity of it all but I also uh, believe that it's important to remind everyone of the protections afforded us uh, under the Constitution and uh, while I'm not here representing any official organization I would like to read this right to self-defense we affirm that lawful gun ownership and carry by the people protects us from those who wish to do harm and our guards against tyranny by our own government. We call upon our elected officials to resist the narrative that the solution to every problem is less freedom and more regulation. And instead, pursue policies that respect freedom while also increasing safety. Constitutional carry. We support constitutional carry legislation through any legislative means so law-abiding citizens may carry any legally owned guns openly or concealed while maintaining the option of a permit for reciprocity purposes only. Gun-free zones. We oppose governmental pro prohibitions on citizens who have a constitutional right to carry and own firearms and knives from doing so. That be the Republican Party when I say we. <clears throat> we oppose state-mandated location restrictions, the Federal Gun-Free School Zones Act of 1990, and the National Firearms Act. Red flag. We oppose monitoring programs, including the red just flag. Just about out of time, so okay, I'm you need to, just you, please don't read the whole thing. Um, Are you reading for the Repo Republican Party? I'm reading on behalf of myself, okay. but uh, they hold values that, that I hold dear as well. And I just finished this last one. And I one. might add, these don't apply to what all Republicans think. I just okay. want to say that. All right. What's well, uh Yeah, I was going to, Mr. Madam Chair, I was trying to clear up. When you say we, I was asking the Senator Rodriguez. Who's we? So this is the uh, platform of the Republican Party of Texas. And no. so. And that's my point. You're out of time. And if anyone, I think many members are probably familiar with that plank. And if not, they can look it up. Yeah. Senator Whitmire, you, you no, can I don't look have it up online. Once he established <laughs> who we is, because. Okay. I, yeah. I but you can have a, a final you, thought, you, as I've done with everyone, to wrap up. Yeah, we'll we can read that. Okay. No, I don't want him to read it. I said, no, if, if okay, you can read it. Yeah, I, I, do I have can a, read it. I do have a final thought. You I don't know, need as you to read to me. As a, you can have your final thought, as I did with everything. Thank you so much. Yes. Well, uh, 
I appreciate your comment, Senator, but I thought this was a time where individuals may come and you know speak what, what they wanted to speak. And so I stand with my uh, brother in arms here and reiterating the fact that you know uh, our right to bear arms shall not be infringed. Any law saying or you know perpetrating you know, the effect, uh, we will not comply. Come and take it. Thank, thank you, sir. Um, and your name, Mr. Abood? Hi. Yes. You may proceed, sir. My name is Michael Abood. I'm also an Army veteran. Um, I'm going to cut some of my uh, speech because these gentlemen have covered it. We were. <laughs> We've met here today. Um, as he's already mentioned, the Second Amendment does say that the uh, right to bear arms will not be infringed. You all know that. Um, you also know that it's your obligation to uphold the laws of the Constitution of the United States and your oath of office. Um, the people of Texas will remember what goes on here. And I'm very glad to hear that um, you guys are taking a, a, a wider viewpoint than what I initially heard you were going to do. Um, I was going to talk about the plaque um, about the Second Amendment that sits on the, um, the lawn at the state capitol. Um, talked about the Second Amendment and that George Washington said that uh, a free people ought not to only be armed and disciplined, but they should have sufficient arms and ammunition to maintain a status of independence from any who might uh, attempt to abuse them, which would include their own government. Um, and that is something that a lot of us are worried about. Um, I want to go on and skip to uh, further in my prepared notes. Um, I was at Walmart that morning. I was lucky and I left. I had left to take care of my shopping um, about 40 minutes or so before the event happened. <clears throat> it's not the uh, first time violence has happened at a Walmart. Uh, several years back, there was a woman who was being stabbed by her husband. A uh, concealed carry um, member pulled his weapon and ended that violence, saving her life. Had I been there or any of the people that have concealed carry weapons with them, had them with them at the time, they would have stopped the violence. And a lot of <clears throat> our fellow passengers would still be alive or not injured. The event would have ended at that point. Um, I want to point out that you all have armed guards out in front. But what you're telling us, a, a lot of what we're hearing is that you don't want us to have the same protection. Well, it's up to us to protect ourselves. Right now, I only have my holster. My gun is, is put in a safe place wrap for this up your event. Thoughts or just yes, ma'am. Um, but you can't take away our right to protect ourselves. <clears throat> and I hope that I'm able to um, respond to Senator Rodriguez's statements because I do agree with. Um, if, does some, you have any questions, Senator Rodriguez? No. Oh, okay. Well, he, I know he, he's, but he's, he's mentioned. I know, sir, but I have to. Everyone's. I'm trying to be fair to give right, everybody an equal amount of time, and and I've given you a little time to wrap up, so you're you're out of time. Right. So, right. thank you very much. Thanks to everyone. Who's thank you all for thanks your attention. To the okay. James Panado, or Panado, Stephanie Carr, Margarita Sanchez, and Mika Jones. Peinado. Peinado. Sorry. <laughs> Very good. Afternoon. Uh, my name is James Larul Peinado. I serve as the director for Open Carry Texas in El Paso. In promptness, uh, the policy I think would benefit, most benefit Texans seeking to prevent mass violence from occurring would be for, Texas, for the Texas government to do away with the permitting process, which is obstructing what is our natural right to carry a basic tool, a handgun, for self-defense. Most Americans are surprised to find out that Texans are denied this right by our legislature unless they have a permission slip. 
How did Texas, where the come and take it flag was unfurled in glorious defiance, become disarmed? While not five miles from here in New Mexico, no permit is required. With special attention given to, I've heard State Senator Jose Rodriguez's sincere concerns about white supremacy and oppressed minorities, I wish to emphasize that the right to keep and bear arms, like all other natural rights, are meant to be affirmed by government mostly for the protection of minorities. It is only when government and the societies that abide them deny them these rights that we have a countless examples to show how their denial was intended for purposes of facilitated subjugation and targeted, uh, of a targeted minority. According to Dr. Stephen Hallbrook, uh, pre-Civil War Texas actually looked a lot more like the North and other Southern states. Uh, there were very few gun restrictions. No one in Texas, regardless of race, was denied the right to possess or carry arms in any manner. At a time when slaves in most states were legally disarmed, there was no such laws and whites, Mexicans, and blacks could wear concealed arms. The codes of 1859 showed that only the misuse of weapons was punishable. Even in the slave codes, it was only punishable if they'd used arms uh, to harm others. Uh, but they were permitted to resist others with uh, threats to themselves lawfully with arms. Take note, in the journals of your predecessors, the Texas legislature passed the first gun control measure which sought to under, undo the more liberal gun laws of Texas's recent past. The closest Texas came to adopting a black code provision to disarm freedmen was uh, declared, it basically, if you were on somebody else's plantation as a sharecropper and they didn't give you permission to carry arms, uh, that's how they restricted freedmen. And that's how we first got the permitting process and denial to carry handgun. Uh, closer to home, according to Borderland historian and UTEP professor, Dr. David Romo, before Texas was even Mexico, Spain was implementing the regulating of arms in order to facilitate the colonization of the Apache Indians at Paso del Norte and all throughout their empire. They were permitted their bows and arrows, but intentionally barred from possessing pistols or okay. muskets. You need to wrap up your thoughts, sir. Yes, ma'am. Well, okay. just the history of gun control is much to do with the uh, targeted subjugation of oppressed minorities. Uh, you can look at Ries Lopez Tiorina, who fought to seek justice for Indo Hispanos, or you could look at how uh, Governor Reagan instituted gun control to restrict Black Panthers. And Thank so, you, I, sir. yes, ma'am. One, one quick question. Sure, go ahead. Uh, do you think someone on parole for a violent offense should be allowed to carry a gun? Parole's a limited time, correct, sir? Do I understand? Mm -hmm. I, I do believe that if you, you committed you were a. You're saying that we shouldn't restrict any carrying of weapons and. The first, as chairman of criminal justice, I was thinking that, yes, how sir. do you feel about parolees? Open carry. A convicted felon yes, for sir. a violent offense. Open carry Texas takes the position that if you have a criminal offense in your record, uh, you do lose the right to keep and bear arms. Oh, but so, if you so, have, we can, so we can restrict under the Second Amendment. Uh, with more time, we can And you do know nuances. that the come and get it phrase was talking about a cannon. Yes, sir. We okay. have a right to cannons. Ms. Carr? No. Stephanie? She's not here. She's not here? Okay, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, Margarita Sanchez? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for being here in El Paso. My name is Margarita Sanchez. I am retired and a full-time volunteer. <laughs> I am here in hopes that our input will be taken seriously and that real change comes out of this effort. We all know what happened August 3rd. During that time, we were shaken before anything that we had experienced. Many of us have been going through being scared, angry, and feeling extremely vulnerable. Here we are three months later, and many of us are still wondering if another incident like what happened will repeat itself. I am here because I got involved in a volunteer basis with a family from Chihuahua who were here shopping at the Walmart. A father, a mother, and a nine-year-old daughter who had been shot at Walmart. Thank God they all survived. However, the father who Mayor mentioned is still in the hospital. The bullet went through his back and exploded in his stomach. His intestines were damaged. The doctors at UMC have done a very, the very best that they can to help with his injuries. Unfortunately, right now, he cannot eat. He hasn't eaten. The doctors are saying that maybe in February. 
The mother was shot also, but since her husband protected her and the nine-year-old who, was all, who also had fragments removed from her leg, they're doing much better. We were able to get the little girl in school just to keep her mind off what is happening uh, to her dad. I bring this story to you because when you make your recommendations to the governor, you need to keep this family and all others in mind. It takes courage to make the right decision that affects many lives, not only in El Paso, but throughout Texas. There is absolutely no reason for assault weapons in the hands of anyone. So I'm going to ask you two things. We heard that the CBC does not, is not going to help with our families from Chihuahua. And we would like very much for you to consider taking that that happened here um, that you think about it because they were here to shop, to spend their money, the money as green as ours, and they were injured. They and didn't expect that. And the other one is to ban the um, assault rifles. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, Mika Jones? Hi, and thank you, Madam Chair and Senators, for this opportunity to speak publicly on this very critical issue. My name is Micah Cohen-Jones, and I currently serve as the president of the board of the El Paso Holocaust Museum, and I would like to speak today on behalf of the museum and our mission. Um, after a massive attack targeting our Latinx community here in El Paso, it is far past time for our communities and our leadership to address the toxic mixture of racism and nationalism combined with the easy access to weapons that we have seen over and over again play out in mass shootings across the country. As a museum, it is our mission to educate the public, to be aware of the history of the Holocaust indiscriminate violence fueled by hate and discrimination which is unfortunately so relevant today. The Anti-Defamation League has provided evidence-based research to suggest that today, hate crimes and white supremacy are on the rise. There was a 20% rise in 2017 that more than tripled in 2018. People talk about the shooter here as a lone actor, but in fact, we must contextualize these acts in history and not ignore their systemic roots. As I said, a large part of our mission at the museum is education. And one start to fight against racism and discrimination is to teach respect and tolerance in our public school curricula by doing better at sharing the common history of all humanity, including its most tragic chapters. Earlier, there was a discussion about standing up and flagging mental illness when you see it, and I would like to add how critical it is for each one of us to be upstanders when we see acts of injustice. If we hear or see something racist, we also must say something. Recently, um, the American Psychological Association president issued a statement that in part reads, the rates of mental illness are roughly the same around the world, yet other countries are not experiencing these traumatic events as often as we face them, one critical factor is access to and the lethality of the weapons that are being used in these crimes. But she also adds that racism and intolerance and bigotry added to the mix is a recipe for disaster. And you need to wrap up your thoughts. Yeah. I would just like to say that as leaders in Texas state government, we urge you to take hate, to take racism inspired mass violence seriously and to see it is quite distinct actually from issues of mental illness. And I would say that a narrow focus on mental illness or even on sensible gun laws that I absolutely support individually would be irresponsible, evasive, and even dangerous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to this panel for participating. Thank you.
We'll call it the next panel, Arlinda Valencia, David Aguirre, Jr., Sylvia Sirfoss, I think that's what your name, and Rocio Fierro Perez. Ms. Valencia? Yes. Is that on? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I'm Orlinda Valencia, and I'm president of the Isleta Teachers Association. And I'm here today to ask you to help support teachers in the classroom by making sure that all the students are safe and protected from anyone who's wanting to harm them. Teachers must be able to teach their students in a safe, learning environment. Teachers today do so much more than just teach. Teachers shouldn't have to worry about anything other than their subject matter and should not have to worry whether their gun is loaded and ready to go. Teachers should have not have anything to do with guns at all, period. Training teachers to fight back is not the answer. I'm asking all of you today to please take a stand on sensible gun control and keep guns out of the classroom. I'm also here today to advocate passage of a con congressional bill that will help educate all teachers and staff members on how to detect students with mental and emotional health disorders. Stopping future acts of violence must start with well-trained educators. In reference to the August 3rd tragedy, I'd like to say that El Paso will never heal over this shooting. You see, I'm a descendant of the Puerto Vinian Massacre, where my great-grandfather was murdered with 14 other men and boys. That happened over 100 years ago, and my heart aches for my great-grandfather and the other victims every single day. El Paso will move forward, but the hurt and the memories will never die. We also have to keep vigilant on taking care of the families and the survivors of that day because many will suffer survival's remorse. My great-grandmother lived and suffered for 12 years after the massacre before taking her own life. I believe that education is the key in all fields. Teachers should be left to teach. Law enforcement should be left to protect and medical professionals should be left to take care of people's health care. I appreciate you being here today, and I hope that you can help us. Thank you. Uh, Senator Zapparini. Ma'am, do you know if the teacher organizations are addressing the issues that you addressed? We are. We are trying our best to go to school boards and getting uh, each of the school districts to, uh, I know in our district, Isleta, uh, they're already training teachers on how, how to uh, work in the classroom with their students, to recognize uh, students and their reactions. They're also uh, being trained on how to deal with students of mass shootings, because we do have those in the classroom. But do you know the teacher organizations like TSTA or Well, this AMT. my organization is TSTA. Right, but are the organizations themselves taking positions on the very issues you addressed? Yes. They are? Yes, we are. Thank you. Thank you very much. David Aguirre. Thank you very much. Whenever a tragic event occurs, we as a nation often seek a scapegoat. When Columbine occurred, the media and lawmakers went after music. When the Aurora Massacre occurred, the media and lawmakers went after the weapon. When Sandy Hook occurred, the media and the lawmakers went after the weapon. If the scapegoat mentality is and it applies for firearms and we are contempt with using it, I don't see why we could blanket this term and use it for everything. Why can't we blame forks for making people fat or pens for making mistakes? Common sense being their tools and they their uses and their mistakes are from the operator. See a gun is a tool and it is the operator's mindset that makes it good or bad. Guns 
are not inherently good or bad, but today in our political discussion, we're made to believe that the Second Amendment doesn't matter, when in reality, gun control is a lazy fix because it's much harder for us to actually look at ourselves and say, you know what, maybe it's a societal issue. Now, the issue at hand here, how can we fix it? I think this is a hard question for us to ask and yet a more difficult one for all of us to answer. But I think the key components are, one, we have to see that mass killings of any kind are more so a product of the person behind the weapon. And two, we make it easier for us as a society to see that people who intend to kill do not need a gun. In Canada, for example, Vincent Lee decapitated Tim McLean, who was sitting next to him on a Greyhound bus, taunted well, eight parts of his head, and taunted police on a four-hour standoff. So I think when it comes to the regards of what can we do, I think it really rings true that this is a hard question to ask, and yet a very hard one to legislate and answer. And I hope that through more continuous discussions and more rigorous discussions, we can one day come to a common road where this will be a one and done issue. Thank you. I have a quick question. Sure. Sir, I'm just curious, if you don't mind me asking, how did you know about today's meeting? I was informed through a political science instructor, sir. Say what? A political science instructor? Yes, sir. During, during class hours? I mean, yes, sir. What was the context, if I might ask? Because I'm learning who we're representing today or listening to. What was the context that a professor... Oh, yes, sir. Before every class period, he discussed certain events that are going on in the university, and he talked about this one in particular and said that this is maybe one thing that maybe we as a community don't know how to voice our opinion, and maybe this is one way where we can sure. get multiple viewpoints out of it. That's good. That's part of the education process. Well, see, I thought you were a member of the gun, your, your sticker, the Gun Owners of America. That is well, sir. So just by chance you're a member, but then you had a professor that brought to your Yes, sir. I didn't become a member until today, sir. Oh. <laughs> oh, you got recruited today, more or less. You could say that. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad I asked. That, that she had some light on, because uh, I, I, I know they're present today and in serious numbers, so I was just wondering if they had a newsletter, email, but you actually had a professor that kind of asked you or, or suggested this would be interesting. You got here and became a member. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you for being here. And Senator Whitmer, so you know, we did ask the university to, you know, let the students know that we were coming. Yes, yes. It was uh, completely on his own. He did the research and yeah. found out. And we, we he passed on the information to us. To oh, I do too. I, I mean, wanted uh, the community to participate. We I want out everybody to participate. But uh, it's just good to know. It's informational know how you got here. Yes, sir. Well, Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for being here. Sylvia Sirfus. <laughs> My name is Sylvia Sirfus. I'm here as a private citizen. I am a retired nurse and I am really concerned about violence in general in our, in our society. And I think we all are getting a good picture of what happened here in El Paso. All the ramifications, you know, of what can happen when something like this, this mass violence did happen to, in our community. And it affected so many people in so many ways. And it's, there's just so many issues. So I think, you know, you all will have to take into consideration that it's, that it's not an easy fix. And there's a lot of things to take into consideration. Um, but we do have to take this seriously because it's getting worse. That's one of the statistics that I heard today is that there are, and we were aware that there are more mass, mass violence. It, um, I hate to call it an event, you know, but you know, but, you know happenings, and um, we have to we have to take it seriously because look at what's happened to El Paso. Look at what's happened, I guess, to, in the other communities. Uh, it affects so, so many people in so many different ways. Um, um, and so that's what I want to ask of you is to take it seriously, okay? We do have to ask ourselves some really tough questions about what are our values? Do we value human life? Uh, this, is, this is a life or death issue. Um, I know I was really struck when I heard on television one of the, the surgeons talking about a, Really, this was a very um, uh, 
a, not a simple surgery, but it, was, it had to do with a foot. But all the surgery that that young man was going to have to go through. You know, those assault weapons do a lot of damage to, uh, to a body. You know, I'm not a doctor, but uh, as a nurse, I know my anatomy and physiology. And those are lifelong um, uh, injuries that they're going to have to live with. And we have to stop it. And so I am for rational gun, con gun protections. You know, we need to protect ourselves. That's what we're about, protecting our community, community safety. And so that's what I want you all to take away from here from El Paso. And thank you for coming. Um, let's see, who do we have? Ma'am, let's see. Rocio. Rocio, yes. Rocio. Rocio Fierro Perez. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rocio Fierro Perez. I am a proud and active member of the El Paso Ciudad Juarez Binational Bicultural Community. And like you all, I was elected to represent a group of people. I am the vice president of the El Paso Community College Student Government Association, where I represent 30,000 students across five campuses. It is my responsibility to listen to their concerns the way you all are doing currently and to act on their behalf, which is why I'm here today. And I sincerely hope that you all do the same and act towards a solution that will allow us to feel safe as students. Do you know what it's like to worry every single day for my friends, my family, for 30,000 students at El Paso Community College and for my own life? As students, we are working towards bettering our lives and our communities. It affects our ability to concentrate on our education. This is affecting students across the entire country. The anxiety my fellow classmates, um, the anxiety that my fellow classmates have has skyrocketed and continues to grow, and with good reason, don't you think? Remember that. I also want you to remember and think about a student or someone if you have, if you have a, loved, a loved one that is currently going to school, I want you to think about them and think about their heart pounding in their chest when they hear any loud noise across the hall, when uh, they've spent hours upon hours studying for an exam and they can no longer focus on because of the real and par paralyzing fear that they have of being shot and killed like so many others around the country. We should not be worried about our lives while we sit in class and listen to our instructors. Coming from a community college perspective where students and professors with a license can carry a concealed weapon on a college ground I am terrified at the thought of losing even more members of my community and that of my own life. We all know that there are designated areas where guns are allowed and other areas where they are prohibited. My concern and the concern of the 30,000 students in my college is that there is no way of knowing whether or not an individual will respect those regulations, which is why we are asking you, which is why I am asking you today to act, to let us focus on our education, to take a stand and allow community colleges across Texas that you represent to determine for themselves whether or not their college campuses will allow concealed carry without it being mandated. Because I understand that we have different communities, especially within Texas, we're, we're a very large state. But I think that every community college and schools should be able to determine for themselves. Yes, Thank you very much. Thanks to this panel. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, just for yeah, clarification. Yeah, Sarah Hancock. Yes, thank you. Just for clarification on some numbers, according to Pew, Pew Research, uh, the number of suicides and murders has actually declined since 1992. Um, we have seen a significant increase in suicides since uh, 2006, which coincides with the iPhone and social media uh, where we saw things change. And so just so that it's statistics accurate, right. uh, both murder and suicide have significantly declined declined between 1992 and 2006. Uh, suicides began to go up in 2006, where murder stayed low until, uh, continued to decline until 2015. So, right, and I think that's one of the things this committee needs to do is to gather all the different data points that, because people come and give us data and information. But right, and we have factual data is more important than just the data we're given from time to right. time. So we're gonna try to gather that information and make sure that everyone has the most updated information from the most kind of objective sources that we can find. And I will say in our schools, I was on the school safety committee with Senator Taylor as well. One of the things we found out is that we had experts tell us that our schools, we've created soft targets uh, of our schools. 
um, was one of the things that we did learn on that. Now, it's hard politically to mm -hmm. change that. We did adopt the school martial law, but one of the things the experts did tell us in that committee hearing during the same process is that by having the gun-free zones, we have essentially created soft targets of our schools, which is something we need to assess as well. And I think we've done some work on that last session by strengthening the school martial system. And I'll say it again because people get upset, but it's a completely voluntary program. And Sir Taylor, you can and we address added, that. Didn't and we added money for security for school Better resource training officers. As well. yep. uh, training for teachers to recognize mental health issues as they're seeing them in the classroom. Uh, identified a number of ways for students can help report to students yeah. who may need some help. Yep. Uh, to get them the help they need before they get so far off the path. And it's completely volunteer. Each school district makes its own decision, not state mandated. That's to correct. your point about your concern, that that's a local control. That's right, Senator Wetmore. Senator All right, thank you very much, Madam this Chair. panel. Yes, Senator Campbell, I'm I sorry. I'm just going to add one thing. In sure. In 2015, Senator Birdwell passed the bill to allow concealed handgun carry to carry on public campuses, private campuses. Private universities can set their own policy, right. but if you have a concealed handgun license, you may carry on campus. Right, and so what I was um, asking is for community colleges to be able to make that decision as well. Yes, they, sh they should be. Just to add, there are some areas in on campuses yeah. that can be, um, right. as we are right now, this is a public meeting area. Right. It does have, it is posted legally. Yes. All right, thank y'all. Rachel Curtis, Veronica Frescas, Evan Carcerano, maybe, or Cavarano, and Hannah Rebecca Hollenberg. So it's Rachel Curtis, Veronica Frescas, Evan Carcerano, maybe, and Hannah Rebecca Hollenberg. Okay, you can get started. Your name, sir? Evan Carcerano. Go ahead. Madam Chair, members of this committee, thank you for being in El Paso today. I would like to start off by reading an excerpt of a Supreme Court case, District of Columbia versus Heller. Like most rights, the Second Amendment right is not unlimited. It is not a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever in any manner uh, or, and for whatever purpose. For example, concealed weapon prohibitions have been upheld under the amendment or state analogs. The court's opinion should not be taken to cast doubt on long-standing prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill, or laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places such as schools and government buildings, or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. Um, one of my biggest fears is my parents are school teachers, and I fear that one day I'm going to turn on the television and see a headline that there is a shooting occurring at either one of their respective schools. Um, I don't know how I'd react in that situation. And so I just want to call on this committee after you conduct review and compile all your findings and all your data to call on Governor Abbott to call a special session of the legislature to try to implement possible solutions to ensure that violent acts that occurred on August 3rd in El Paso do not occur ever again. I was not in El Paso during the shooting. I was visiting family in the Northeast, and I, it just, the feeling of calling everybody on my phone to make sure they were okay, and fearing if they didn't pick up the phone, something I never really want to do again. And uh, another recommendation for, for members of this committee as political actors is to transition away from the politics of define and contrast and more toward a politics of compromise, a politics of working together, uh, a politics of justice for the victims, and a politics of uh, just moving away from winner takes all, because I think it is eroding our democracy and it is eroding our possibility to implement solutions. Thank you. Thank you. And your name, ma'am? I've got a couple of people that didn't show. Hannah Hollenberg. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> My name is Hannah Hollenberg, and I represent Hope Border Institute, a local nonprofit that works at the intersection of border justice, human rights, and Catholic social teaching. Uh, 
Um, the act of violence and hatred that was visited in our community has reverberated across the world and caused boundless pain for the people of El Paso and Juarez. Latinos especially feel that they are under attack and are being further pushed to the margins in a country and state that consistently fails to honor their humanity, dignity, and valuable contributions and has failed to acknowledge the legacy of violence against their forebears. Where before there was little fear of going to the store, going to a movie, or attending school, El Pasoans have now begun to think twice about the daily activities we once took for granted. Children especially have struggled to understand the new reality and are unable to process the fear and trauma that comes with frequent mass shooting drills. People in Juarez continue to live with the threat of violence, aided by the proliferation of American-made weapons that flow far too easily from the US to Mexico. While lawmakers express unfounded fears of an invasion by Latin American immigrants, many of whom are seeking asylum, few have spoken about the serious threat of assault weapons easily making their way to Mexico and Central America via straw purchases and traffickers aided by lax gun laws. On behalf of Hope Border Institute, I call on members of the Select Committee in the Senate to adopt meaningful proposals that would put a halt to endless violence that takes lives in mass shootings and in individual acts of pain and rage. The conversation has to move beyond video games, social media, and background checks. We have to address the racism embedded in American life that has become even more deadly because of the availability of weapons of war. We have to address the fact that women are killed every day with guns wielded by abusive partners. And we have to address the fact that not only can people buy weapons online, in stores, at gun shows, and in countless other locations, but now they can 3D print them. I call on members of the Senate to support a ban on assault weapons, high capacity magazines, bump stocks, and other tools that make weapons deadlier. I call on members of the Senate to create a licensing system for gun purchases, including individual assessments, background checks, training, waiting periods, and a comprehensive gun registry. And you need to wrap your thoughts up, Naomi, out of time. And we need to combat, in addition to taking these measures, we need to combat racism, colorism, and Islamophobia at all levels of society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naomi. Yeah. Yes, Senator Rodriguez. Can, uh, yeah, I want to follow up with, with one question. Uh, combating racism, as you just put it, uh, do, do you have any suggestions, any ideas? Any, any approaches that uh, we could look at to deal with that? White supremacy, racism, hate crimes? Um, yes, I think, I mean, we have to hold our, our leaders accountable because speech that happens at the top, um, you know, speech by, by elected leaders is very important. And so when mm -hmm. we have racism upheld in, in public life by elected leaders, that has a, a really devastating and really, um, a terrible impact on on public life. So we have to really we have to hold our leaders accountable. We have to insist that racism cannot be part of, of public dialogue in this way. And I mean it's not something, you know, there's been such a legacy of violence against black people, against Mexicans, Mexican Americans, um, mm -hmm. Muslims, Asian Americans, and immigrants, undocumented and not. So I mean there's no easy way to address that, but I mean, we can we can start by acknowledging that that people are people that they have their dignity. You know, they deserve dignity. They deserve to live. They deserve to not be um, killed and and vilified. So I think we can start there. We can educate, um, you know, children in public schools about the importance of respecting and honoring differences. We can we can work to end police violence against um, communities of color. So there's, I mean, there's no, you know, I'm not going to cover all bases right. here, but you know, I think it's it's really important that we that we act now and we act quickly because people's lives are on the line and and we should be aiming for communities of color to thrive, not just to not just to survive, but to but to thrive. No. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Y'all y'all are excused. And Rachel Curtis was not here, and Veronica Prescott did not respond. Okay, next panel. Uh, Tammy Maccabean, um, Manuel Castruga, or Castri, Castriuda, Debbie Tell Tellis, and Adolfo Tellis. Tellis, Tellis. I should have known that. Tellis. Who's Tammy's not here? Okay, Tammy is not here. So Manuel, you can go ahead.
right, you can go ahead, sir. Um, honorable Chair, Madam Chair, I want to thank you and your esteemed colleagues for being here in El Paso today. Um, I am a, the Director of Counseling and Advising for the El Paso Independent School District and also a member of the El Paso Area Directors of Guidance and Counseling, so we represent all 12 districts within the county and all 560 school professional school counselors within our region. And we're very proud of that work. And so um, you've already heard a lot of sides in relating to the event that took place here on August 3rd. I really want to frame my comments to two types of voices that I think you have made some inroads in past legislative sessions. I want to commend you for the passage of David's Law. When that was enacted, that gave us teeth at the school level to be able to address cyberbullying. Mm -hmm. Allowed us with some sense of satisfaction to be able to get into classrooms and talk to kids about being observers, being responsible for one another. As counselors, I am beholden to them and they are beholden to me. It's a symbiotic relationship. Last, last legislative session, you also introduced Senate Bill 426. I ask that you reintroduce that bill. That is the bill that really, really focuses on the, on the work that professional school counselors went to school for. We went to be able to work with kids talking about behavioral health, not testing, master scheduling, all of those ad nauseum administrative duties that tackle us from a day in and day out basis. You want us to address mental health in the schools. You want us to address discipline. You want us to address social media and comportment and social emotional learning. Help us to do that work by reintroducing that piece of legislation that allows us to do the work that we went to school to do for. I am a proud 32 year veteran of the public school system proud of the counselors I had, and I want to follow in those footsteps. And I speak for the 500 counselors that we have in this county, for my district, for the 60,000 students that we have, and the 6,000 teachers that we employ. Last year, when we talk about education and prevention, we made an aggressive effort through 915 CARES, an entire regional collaborative, to support suicide prevention and awareness. We've had zero in our district suicide attempts from the last year. We've had 800 outcries. Kids know we care. Help us to show them that you care too. Thank you. You know what I think? I think that the kids in this area are completely lucky to have someone as passionate as you committed to them. And I think you deserve a round of applause. Yeah. You're, you're very impressive, sir. Thank you very, very much. Any questions? Um, Debbie Tejas. Tejas? Is that correct? Got it. Good afternoon. I'm a mother, a grandmother, a community volunteer, and president of West El Paso Republican Women. My family owns guns and some are LTC holders. Our weapons are for hunting, target shooting, protection, and we re respect the weapons as all responsible gun owners do. The shooting in El Paso on August 3rd has impacted all El Pasoans. A Congress Congresswoman Escobar's town hall that morning when she told us there was an active shooter situation my heart skipped a beat. Our hearts are all still heavy with sorrow for those who lost loved ones or were injured that day. I, along with many others, paid our respects at the memorial at Walmart, attended prayer vigils and the city's memorial. I stood in 100 degree temperatures to greet President Trump alongside of those who didn't want him here. I agree with our mayor. This event will not define us as a city. This outsider came to our city with the purpose of hurting others and will have to answer to the Almighty when his time comes. In the meantime, we come together as one to help those who have survived this tragedy. I attended Yabasta after the shooting. It's a town hall put on by Congresswoman Escobar and Gifford Foundation. I listened as they advocated for improving our lives with red flag laws, gun restrictions, gun buybacks,